Okay, we can be grateful that the Federalist Society has decided to close this convention with a panel on something that does not involve administrative law. <laughs> We're going to instead discuss the great Chief Justice, John Marshall. And uh, for this occasion, uh, we've, the Federalist Society has, as usual, assembled a great panel. Um, first and foremost, um, Rick Brookheiser, the se a senior editor at National Review, who is the author of several books. I'm a fanboy, I admit it. I brought with me Alexander Hamilton American, one of my favorite of his bi biographies. Gentleman revolutionary, Gouverneur Morris, the rake who wrote the Constitution. Founding father, <laughs> rediscovering George Washington. He's also written a book about James Madison, but today we're here to discuss his newest book, the title of our panel, John Marshall, The Man Who Made the Supreme Court. We are then gonna have, after an overview by Mr. Brookheiser about his book, about the life, legacy, judicial career of John Marshall, we're going to have some responses uh, from other members of the panel. All of us have had uh, the privilege of, of reading an advanced copy of this book. Uh, and we're going to begin with um, my colleague, uh, Kevin Newsom, a circuit judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. Uh, judge Newsom is a graduate of Samford University and Harvard Law School, after which he clerked for Judge Dermot O'Scanlan on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and then served as a law clerk for Justice David Souter on the Supreme Court of the United States. He engaged in the private practice of law here in our nation's capital. And before moving back home uh, to the state of Alabama, uh, where he was hired to, to serve as the Solicitor General of the state of Alabama. Who hired you for that job? Oh, yeah, who was that? <laughs> He served. He ran off and left me <laughs> yeah, he, his question was, who, who ran off and left me with a, a couple of months later? <laughs> he then engaged in the private practice um, in, of law in, in Birmingham before being appointed last year by the president uh, to our court. Uh, we'll then have uh, a few remarks from Judge Kyle Duncan of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Uh, Judge Duncan was educated at Louisiana State University. I was in Baton Rouge recently. <laughs> Eight in a row. <laughs> and the Louisiana State University Paul M. Bear Law Center. And he has an LLM from Columbia. He clerked for Judge John Dewey on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, practiced law in Texas, was an assistant solicitor general of Texas, appellate chief for the Office of Attorney General um, of Louisiana, and general counsel uh, for the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, and practiced law as well here in our nation's capital uh, before being recently appointed to the Fifth Circuit. And then we will, we will have some remarks from uh, David Rivkin of B Baker Hotstedler, a partner there. Um, David is a member of the firm's litigation international and environmental teams and is co-leader of the firm's national appellate practice. He's a graduate of Georgetown University where he also earned a master's degree in Soviet affairs. He earned his law degree at Columbia Law School and served in two different presidential administrations, the Reagan administration and the first Bush administration, the George H.W. Bush administration. He served as an associate White House counsel. He's published hundreds of articles, op-eds, book reviews, and book chapters on a variety of legal topics. So we'll begin with some remarks by Rick Brookheiser, an overview 
about the great Chief Justice, Mr. Brooke Kaiser. Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be on such a distinguished panel and before such a distinguished room. Uh, I'm sorry that the Supreme Court hasn't been in the news in the last few months, but I'll try and make it as interesting as possible. I, I just want to say uh, a few things about the great Chief Justice. I want to start by explaining a little bit about who he was, talk a little bit about how he ran the court, and maybe talk about one of his crucial decisions. I think the most important fact about John Marshall is that he was a country boy. Uh, he lived much of his adult life in Richmond. He spent one month a year as Chief Justice in Washington. He spent months in Philadelphia, six months in Paris. But he was born and raised in Fauquier County, Virginia. The first house he lived in was a log cabin. The Marshalls didn't get glass in their windows until the third house he lived in. And they were, they were never poor, and they were never exactly pioneers, but they were country people. And this was a quality that stayed with him all his life. The word that people used to describe him over and over again is simple. Uh, he had simple tastes in how he dressed and how he looked. His wife cut his hair. Uh, he was uh, riding circuit in Raleigh, North Carolina once. He forgot to pack a pair of pants. And when he got to Raleigh, the local tailors couldn't supply his lack, so he, he heard his cases just draping his robe over his legs. Uh, he liked drinking. Uh, the court, when he got on it, had a custom that uh, when the judges, after a day of hearing cases, when they were deliberating over dinner or after dinner, they could only have wine if it were raining outside. And I assume this was to cheer themselves up. But so Marshall would always ask one of his colleagues to look out the window and, and tell him uh, what the weather was. And Brother Story might say, uh, the sun is shining. And Marshall would say, our jurisdiction is so vast that by the law of chances, it must be raining somewhere. <laughs> so wine was always served to the Marshall court. Marshall also liked simple games. He belonged to a club in Richmond called the Quoits Club. And they met every Saturday in all the warm months. And Quoits was horseshoes, but played with a metal ring. And, and people testified that, that Marshall seemed to spend almost as much attention deciding whose Quoit was closer to the post as he did on his great decisions. So this was, this was a man of very um, simple habits. The man he loved most in the world was George Washington. He served under Washington in the Revolution. Uh, he, he was in three battles where Washington commanded, Brandywine, Germantown, Monmouth. And in the midst of those, he was at Valley Forge where Washington also commanded. Uh, he felt that Washington was the rock on which the Revolution had rested. Uh, after the war, he followed Washington again because Washington presides over the Constitutional Convention, signs it, endorses it, and Marshall is a delegate to the Virginia Ratifying Convention, a strong pro-Constitution delegate. And then when the first American two-party system arises, the Federalists versus the first Republican Party, both Washington and Marshall are Federalists. And in 1798, Washington summons Marshall to Mount Vernon, tells him he has to run for Congress. The Federalist Party needs bucking up in Virginia. And Marshall doesn't want to do it because he's making good money as a lawyer and he has a family, he's buying land. Uh, and, and finally, he decides he just has to get up at the crack of dawn and leave. He can't keep saying no to this man he reveres so. But Washington got up earlier and put on his old uniform. <laughs> Marshall said, I yielded to his representation. The man he hates is his second cousin once removed, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Jefferson thinks, Mar and Jefferson returns that hatred. <laughs> Jefferson thinks Marshall is a sophist, that he will take anything and twist it into a predetermined legal conclusion. He warns Joseph Story before Story joins the court, you must never give a direct answer to any question Marshall asks you. <laughs> 
If you were to ask me if the sun is shining, I would say, I don't know, sir. I cannot tell. <laughs> Marshall thinks that Jefferson is a demagogue. He talks a great game about letting Congress take the lead, but he secretly manipulates it for the purposes of his own popularity. So in, in the election of 1800, Thomas Jefferson beats the second president and the last Federalist president, John Adams. John Adams has tapped Marshall to serve as his Secretary of State, promoting him from, from the Congress to his cabinet. So in the lame duck period of the Adams administration, Adams learns that the then Chief Justice, Oliver Ellsworth, is going to quit. Ellsworth's health is bad, he has gout. So Adams decides to nominate the first man to hold the job, John Jay, great revolutionary patriot, diplomat, spy master. Jay had been Chief Justice from 1789 to 95, and then he had left to be governor of New York. So Adams sends Jay's name to the Senate, and the Senate confirms him. Then he gets a letter from Jay saying he's not going to take the job. Jay explains that the federal judiciary lacks energy, weight, and dignity. He's not going to go back. So Adams is sitting in his office in the still uncompleted White House, it's just an exterior shell, with his Secretary of State, and he says, who shall I nominate now? And Marshall says, I don't know. Adams thinks a moment and says, I believe I will nominate you. So this is how Marshall's name is sent to the Senate, and he is confirmed, and so begins his 34 years as Chief Justice. Now, how does he, how does he run his court? And this, this becomes a partisan problem, because when he joins the court, it's all, all six justices. There are only six at the time. They're all Federalists. But very soon, because of death and retirement, and also Congress expands the size of the court to seven, because the country is growing. By, by 11 years, the partisan balance has shifted to two Federalists and five Republicans. And yet, all these new Republican appointees follow Marshall's lead. Uh, I think he used several techniques. One was his, that simplicity of his personality. Uh, he liked people, and people liked him. And there was a geniality that he managed to impart to any, any group that he belonged to. Another thing he does is he defers. He defers to colleagues who are more expert in certain areas of laws than he is. Land titles go to Thomas Todd. Admiralty law goes to Joseph Story. And when you defer, you get deference in return. It's not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. The third thing is that Marshall is always the smartest man in the room. And these are, many of these are smart guys, and also the lawyers who argue before the court. But they all acknowledge Marshall's superiority. And he doesn't have a quick intelligence. It takes him a while to get going. But when he does, there's something implacable about it. Uh, William Wirt, uh, who was a lawyer before the court, before he becomes attorney general, said that Marshall's mind was like the Atlantic Ocean. Everyone else's minds was, were like mere ponds. So that's the impression Marshall's mind gave. And then the fourth factor is, is time. Marshall is Chief Justice uh, for 34 years into Andrew Jackson's second term. He swears in five presidents and nine inaugurals. There's also, in the middle of that tenure, there's an 11 year period, uh, 1812 to 23, where there's no personnel changes on the court. And that's also a record that's, that's only been tied once. So that's the man, uh, those are his techniques. Um, his most famous decision, of course, is, is Marbury. Uh, the supremacy decisions were probably the most controversial at the time he made them. But the one I just want to talk about briefly has to do with the contract clause, and that's Fletcher v. Peck. Uh, this arose because of a land deal made by the state of Georgia in the 1790s. Georgia was the poorest of the 13 states. All it had uh, as an asset were 35 million acres of land, which are now Alabama and Mississippi. And so uh, the Georgia legislature sold this, this tract uh, for a penny and a half an acre. 
every legislator was bribed. The going rate was $1,000. Uh, one man who took only $600 explained that he wasn't greedy. <laughs> All these lawmakers were replaced at the next election by a new set who passed a repeal act which uh, retracted the sale and forbade it from being brought up in a Georgia court. Uh, the Repeal Act said that any uh, employee of the state of Georgia who referred to the sale in any way would be fined $1,000. They also burned the, the original sale publicly in the state capitol, and the story goes that uh, when they were about to set fire to it, an old man stepped from the crowd and said that the acts of corruption should be burned by fire from heaven. So he held a magnifying glass over the paper and caused it to combust. Well, now the purchasers, of course, were not intending to live in the land they purchased. They wanted to flip it, and they did that almost immediately, selling it to other purchasers who were going to flip it in turn. But all this real estate speculation depended on the original sale being valid. So they got a legal opinion from Alexander Hamilton, who retired from government. He was a lawyer in private practice. And Hamilton said that the Repeal Act was um, uh, impractical and unjust, but it was also unconstitutional because Article I, Section 10 forbids the states from impairing the obligation of contract. And Hamilton uh, knew that clause very well because he was probably responsible for putting it in the Constitution. We can go into that if you like. But uh, that was Hamilton's opinion. But how can it be brought into court? Georgia has forbidden it from coming into its own courts. The 11th Amendment prevents anyone outside Georgia from suing the state of Georgia. But if people in two different states are involved in a suit against each other, that can go to a federal court. So Robert Fletcher of New Hampshire sues John Peck of Massachusetts for $3,000. Peck has sold him some of this Georgia land, but Fletcher says, you didn't have legitimate title to it because of the Repeal Act. I want my money back. And their case uh, rises up to the Supreme Court. Uh, they were both land speculators. This was certainly an arranged case they had to test the sale. Uh, in the 20th century, someone found that, that um, Fletcher's acreage had been altered to make sure that the value was over the minimum to send a case to the Supreme Court. Uh, Marshall's decision follows Hamilton's reasoning. Uh, he says that to revoke a sale in this, this fashion is unjust, but worse, it's unconstitutional because of Article I, Section 10. And the most striking thing to me about his opinion is he says that this is a bill of rights for the people of each state. And I, that, I think that would surprise most people. We think of the Bill of Rights as the first 10 amendments, but Marshall is saying, no, there was a Bill of Rights in the Constitution before those amendments. And it's Article I, Section 10, which prevents states from impairing the obligation of contract. And the reason I, I wanted to single this, this decision out is that when, when we think of the founding fathers who were most responsible for the economic world we live in, we, we think of Hamilton, especially after the musical, but, <laughs> but which, I, which I like, and I, and I think it's pretty accurate. But Hamilton's um, plans and vision needed a legal armature to support them, and that comes from decisions that the Marshall Court makes. Uh, contract decisions uh, also famous commerce decision, Gibbons v. Ogden. So, so that's just my little intro uh, to the man and what he did, and um, I turn it over to my fellow panelists. So I want uh, to begin the discussion among the panelists by asking each of them to give some of their impressions about um, the book, uh, particularly things that perhaps surprised you about John Marshall, things perhaps you did not know uh, before, things that impressed you, um, things that were, um, you know, jarring or even striking. Um, Kevin, you want to start? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, All right, are we on here? Good. Yeah. Um, so I'll start where Rick started. Uh, I sent around an email to my co-panelists yesterday with a list of things that had really sort of startled me about the book. I think it's just a wonderful read. When you get your hands on it, you're not going to be able to put it down. 
there's a lot of law in there and there's also a lot of life in there. So for people, um, you know, largely the people in this room are gonna love the law, but I think you're also gonna love the life. And uh, what, I mo what, what most sort of struck me about the book as Rick began was about his emphasis on Marshall's simplicity. Um, maybe it's because I'm a country boy. I'm, you know, I'm from Alabama. Um, and I, so I sort of identify with the simpleness, the plainness, the primitiveness, um, as Rick describes it, of, you know, lest we sort of forget, probably the most significant judge, not just in American history, but by virtue of this country's emphasis on world affairs, perhaps in world history. Um, and that he viewed himself as a really ordinary guy. And this ordinariness, I think, is oftentimes, regrettably, in short supply among us judges, if we are self-aware enough to recognize it. Um, and, you know, so this is coming from a guy who traipses around the country. Uh, John Malcolm has heard the speech. I gave it to the Heritage Foundation. I've given it to Federalist Society chapters in law schools about what I view to be the three cardinal virtues of good judging, objectivity, humility, and civility. And humility and civility, and we'll hear a lot more about objectivity, I think, because, uh, you know, Marshall, there's a lot of um, originalism and textualism in Marshall's uh, opinions. Uh, so we'll hear a lot about objectivity, but humility and civility were really two of the calling cards of his career. And uh, to read Rick's book, he really believed it, like he wasn't putting it on. He didn't sort of view himself as fancier or more important uh, than the next guy. And not only is that, in my view, sort of just a decent life philosophy, the way you treat other people and the way you view yourself within sort of the cosmos, but it turns out in Marshall's career to have been a very useful character trait. It, it, it enabled him not only to forge unprecedented consensus on the Supreme Court. You know, this is the guy who authored unanimous decision after unanimous decision after unanimous decision in cases that, let's just say, likely wouldn't be unanimous today. But it also enabled him to navigate some really uh, tricky political shoals within the Federalist Party. Uh, Federalists of the early 19th century, lest we forget, didn't always love one another. Uh, the, the Adamses and the Hamiltons didn't love one another. Everybody revered George Washington for their own reasons, but Pinckney was off this way, and, uh, and uh, but Marshall managed to navigate all of that, um, and I think just sort of the common decency with which he treated people uh, served him very well. Um, I like to think I come by my simplicity a little bit more honestly than Marshall did because I am not and never have been and never will be the smartest guy in the room. Uh, and secondly, I don't have my wife cut my own hair. Who needs that? I cut my own hair. <laughs> so for me, there's a lot to talk about in terms of the law and I'm sure we'll get into it, but the thing that struck me most from page one of the book um, really was Marshall's simplicity and the way it just sort of infused everything uh, that he did over the course of his career. Kyle? Thank you, thank you, Judge. Let's see. Am I on? Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me to, to be on this panel, uh, this great panel, and to talk about this great book. Um, it's a wonderful book. Uh, you should all read it. Um, I hope it will encourage people to read uh, not just this book, but more books by Marshall, and go back and Close. read and read his opinions, uh, which, uh, which are just marvelous. So that's the first thing I'd say. Uh, is that the book left me with, it reinforced the impression that I already had of Marshall from law school because I had, I had good con law professors in law school. And they always taught me that Marshall was a giant of the law. Uh, that we shouldn't go back and deconstruct his opinions or what he thought, uh, maybe, maybe some error he made in statutory interpretation or some such thing. That he was a giant, that he laid the foundations for what we understand to be constitutional law. Uh, and that without him, we, we, wouldn't, it's, it's, we, we would definitely not have the Supreme Court uh, and, the, and the legitimacy of the federal judiciary that we have today. We'd have something very different, and I think we'd have something uh, far weaker and far less what the founders understood they wanted when they created Article III. Um, you know, Marshall 
you just said John Jay said he didn't want the job uh, because the federal judiciary lacks energy, weight, and dignity. And I'd say that the thing that I drew from your, your book most clearly is that Marshall came into the court with a court, and maybe Jay was right, that it lacked energy, weight, and dignity, and he didn't want to be bothered to have, take the job. But Marshall left it as an institution that had energy, weight, and dignity um, that could serve the role the founders envisioned for the court. Um, you know, uh, one thing that occurred to me as I was reading this book is that Hamilton wrote in the Federalist, about, he was trying to assure people that the federal judiciary would not be a danger uh, to our freedoms. Right, and one thing he said, and I love to say this to federal judges and in the presence of federal judges, that one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that Hamilton offered is the natural feebleness of the federal judiciary. That the federal judiciary is so weak that it could not possibly be a danger uh, to our freedoms. I mean, it occurred to me that Marshall left the court so strong, did he, you know, did he, uh, did he sort of betray the vision of Hamilton? And I came away from your book thinking, absolutely not, absolutely not. Um, he strengthened the court in the areas where it needed to be strengthened uh, so that when it solved national problems like the, the problem in Fletcher v. Peck that you talk about, which I did not realize before I read your book, the magnitude of that problem, of that, of that crisis caused by the corrupt uh, Yazoo land. I didn't realize that Yazoo land deal covered the states of Alabama and Mississippi. I mean, I've, I've always thought Alabama had questionable origins. Uh, <laughs> Let us not forget my hometown, Mobile, was the first capital of the Louisiana Purchase. <laughs> and the, the Yazoo land deal happened long before Nick Saban got here. So, see, this is what happens. So I'll much better to now. Gentlemen to, uh, <laughs> so, but surprises. But let me just say, that one that reinforced in my mind that, that, that Marshall embodied the independent federal judge or justice that Hamilton was talking about in Federalist 78. Um, and that, that came through very clearly in your book, and, and uh, it's, it's great. So surprises. So I want to echo what Kevin said, or uh, Judge Kevin. Um, uh, that's what my kids call me, Judge Kevin. Yeah. <clears throat> my kids call me Judge Daddy. Yeah. Um, uh, the Marshall's character was, I knew something about it before I read your book, but it really came through as a surprise to me. Uh, his warmth to people, his simplicity, as Kevin mentioned. He was a fun guy. He was a, f I, I imagine you just, you would, you want to have a beer with John Marshall, right? Um, Madeira. Madeira. You, you want to have a Madeira with John Marshall. I don't think, yeah. Um, uh, one thing that came through that was really, um, uh, made an impression on me is his solicitude for his wife. Um, evidently, his wife suffered a lot. Uh, his wife had lost several children. How many children did she lose? Uh, did they lose? Um, two or three died, and there were miscarriages. Yeah, yeah. So she suffered a lot, and he had to, in a sense, arrange his life to make sure that his wife was was taken care of. That wasn't, you know, didn't have a lot of loud noise around her. Just a lot of great solicitude and love for his wife. Um, and that, that made an impression on me. Um, another surprising thing, he wrote his own epitaph. Uh, a couple of days before he died, he wrote his epitaph on July 4th. What year did he die? 1835. 35. And you, you report his epitaph. And here's his, the epitaph that he wrote. John Marshall, son of Thomas and Mary Marshall, was born the 24th of September, 1755, intermarried with Mary Willis Ambler. He called her Polly, right? The 3rd of January, 1783, departed this life the blank day of 18 blank. And I just asked it. Rick to make sure that what that doesn't include is that he was Chief Justice of the United States. Uh, and that's astonishing to me. And I think that says volumes, that speaks volumes about what kind of man that he was. Thank you. David. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, I uh, also wanted to thank Federalist Society for inviting me. One of the probably best aspects of of this exercise. It's rare for somebody like me who practices law for a living to be in the same venue of free appellate judges and not feel nervous. <laughs> um, 
I like the book very much. I'm going to echo some of the themes. That's a disadvantage of going last. I would have certainly mentioned that uh, his uh, treatment of Polly and the fact that he did extremely well in every every sphere of life he uh, he inhabited: politics, family, law. Um, <clears throat> but you know, most of us, at least lawyers who care about constitutional law, have read his decisions. What the book has really done for me is is try to. Uh, bring the whole picture of him as a man, and um, use a fashionable modern term, I think he was ultimately woke. Um, whether you call it simplicity, whether you call it geniality, he was a man who was perfectly comfortable in his own skin, and, and therefore could, uh, could move on from that and, and, and be extremely successful. Um, I guess I did not fully appreciate, although it should not be surprising, how much he personally venerated Washington. I don't just mean the fact that he subscribed to the Federalist philosophy. In a little more time, we can talk about the difference between Washington's Federalism or Hamilton Federalism. But it, it, it really was a very personal uh, relationship. Uh, as some of you may know, he wrote uh, and labored hard at it um, a biography of Washington in many volumes. And I actually. I don't want to say I read all of it, it would not be true, but I at least uh, read parts of it, and it's actually actually quite good. The other thing that, that struck me, it's interesting, we had some <clears throat> discussions uh, of other people on the panel, but also it's very fashionable these days to talk about, well, you know, our, our judges and justices are supposed to be political eunuchs, and I think Marshall's life decisively rebuts this proposition because he was quite political. He, he was in Congress for a short time. He was uh, uh, an activist, um, participated in the ratification of a constitution. Uh, I dare say he was not very fond of Jefferson. Uh, I mean, let's just say he was a very politically active man. He had strong convictions, and yet it did not prevent him from being a great judge, a great justice, which goes to show that the right way to do that if you stick to the proper judicial role and you rule based upon the, the proper sources, it doesn't matter what your political convictions are. You can, you can rise above it. Now, I <clears throat> briefly uh, toyed with an idea that we can uh, borrow some of his uh, consensus-forming skills, aside from the fact that Madeira is not very fashionable these days. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about this earlier today. I mean, the, the fundamental difference is that he had an opportunity to to write on a pretty blank slate, ladies and gentlemen, meaning, of course, the Constitution was there, but most of the big constitutional issues were left to be resolved. And you could adopt an attitude where you can truly incorporate uh, the view of your colleagues and be deferential and, and, and work on it. Unfortunately, we're not in that world anymore. There's lots of constitutional precedents. very difficult to imagine being that flexible. So it, 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 uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great, it's a great precedent, no pun intended, but it's not easy to follow. Uh, the other thing, speaking about my last point about Fletcher versus Speck, the, the thing that, that struck me about the case, again, reading it from uh, you know, the way Richard described it versus just reading the, the decision itself is, is how decisively it rebuts the notion that the essence of judging is to render justice in this particular case, because there's no question that the, uh, the corrupt um, legislation was a bad thing. But what ultimately drove uh, Marshall, correctly so, is the notion that the long-term rules matter far more than, than rendering justice in any particular case. Again, it seems like an obvious proposition, but it's not very obvious these days. So I, uh, I enjoyed it very much and, uh, again, made me appreciate uh, Marshall as a great justice even more once I understood uh, a bit more about uh, Marshall as a man. Okay. So Rick, uh, what does the great Chief Justice have to teach us today about controversies of today? Well, I, I just want to uh, pick up on something that uh, Mr. Rivkin said and, and stress it. Uh, the politics of Marshall's time was poisonous. Mm. I mean, people wring their hands over our politics now with, with a lot of reason. but. We're not back to that level yet. Um, uh, the benchmark is that our politicians aren't killing each other. Uh, you know, when Vice President Cheney shot that man, it was an accident and he lived. 
When, when Vice President Burr shot Alexander Hamilton, it was, it was not, not an accident and he died. And, and one of Marshall's colleagues, one of his Republican nominated colleagues, Brock Holst Livingston, had killed a Federalist in a duel. He shot the guy in the groin and he bled out in five minutes. And this was not mentioned in confirmation. I mean, he just uh, on, on the court. <laughs> And, and dueling, dueling was illegal in every state. Deaths and duels were considered murders in every state. They were never prosecuted because no jury would convict. Because that's what gentlemen did. It was national jury nullification. So, but even so, in that atmosphere, Brockholz Livingston uh, concurs as often as all the other Republicans on his court. Kyle? Um, yeah, so politics. Um, J judges, the independent judge is not supposed to be political, and of course we all agree with that, and that's correct. Um, it, it's easy to look back at Marshall and say he was political, but rereading re his life, rereading his opinions, it strikes me that w he, he operated with cognizance of the political backdrop of his decisions, but he was able to forge a consensus about the result based on the law. Uh, and that's a lot different. So take Fletcher v. Peck, which again, this massive nationwide controversy caused by the corrupt Yazoo land deal, and I, I read, in, I, I don't know how accurate this is, but I read in another account of it, that people were talking secession over, the, yeah, over this in the northeastern states. Marshall could have focused on the rawest political parts of that decision, which is the corruption in the Georgia legislature. That's what ticked everybody off. That's what resulted in the Repeal Act. But he sidesteps that issue completely in his opinion. And he says it would be indecent in the extreme to talk about the corruption in our state legislatures. Now, he doesn't deny that it's there, but he's not going to talk about it. And he's certainly not going to pretend to resolve it. Instead, what does he do? He uses an innovative interpretation of the contract clause to resolve the issue on the basis of the law. Uh, and that strikes me as, uh, and he does that time and time again in his opinions. And um, there's a real difference between that and being a political judge. Kevin? All right, so uh, to tell you what I think the great Chief Justice can teach us today, I'd like, if I can, to juxtapose two quotes from Rick's book. The first is a quotation from an unnamed, eminent federal judge recently retired who said the following. He admitted that he paid, quote, very little attention to legal rules, statutes, or constitutional provisions, close quote, in deciding cases, open quote. A case is just a dispute. The first thing you do is ask yourself, forget about the law. What is a sensible resolution of this dispute? All right, so that is a view very much in vogue. And now let's, tell, let's see what John Marshall can teach us. This is a quotation from Ogden versus Saunders, 1824. The intention of the instrument, that is the Constitution, must prevail. This intention must be collected from its words. Its words are to be understood in that sense in which they are generally used. Exclamation point. Okay. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> once again, the disadvantage of going last as I would have uh, uh, let's just say I echo Judge Newsom's point. Um, let me just add one thing. Um, I greatly esteem the fact that uh, the Chief Justice Marshall found uh, the core constitutional provisions, and not just the contract clause. If you look at a number of other decisions, uh, I would venture a guess that they were not as Bill of Rights-centric as, uh, as a lot of modern decisions are, because I think it's a perfectly obvious point that the entire constitutional architecture, and certainly the contract clause, but the limitations of governmental power, the overarching checks and balances have a lot to do with the protection of individual liberty. I'm not gonna dwell heavily on the parchment barrier discussion, but I mean, one of the sad things now, particularly in law schools, but also in some courts, is the, uh, the reduction of a constitution to the, to the Bill of Rights, which is important to be sure, but not, not the only thing. Okay, um, it's time for some questions. 
Now, we have mics in the front, at the back. Um, I only have one rule. It's the, it's the usual rule. Please make sure that you're asking a question. <laughs> um, we've, we have panelists who are invited to give monologues. <laughs> None of you were. <laughs> so so uh, let's have, um, let's have a, our first question from the back. Do you know what uh, response Chief Justice Marshall made to Andrew Jackson's comment, Chief Justice Marshall has made his decision, let him enforce it, regarding the Indian Removal Act? Um, that comment of Jackson is, is only written down about 30 years later. Uh, Horace Greeley heard it from a congressman, so that's kind of weak, uh, weak justification for it. Jackson did write a letter at the time to a political ally of his saying that the uh, uh, decision that, that Marshall had given in, in, um, in Worcester v. Georgia has fallen stillborn, meaning that Georgia was not going to acknowledge it, was not going to enforce it, and, and Jackson himself had no intention of uh, compelling them to do it. And, and the, the whole case dies, it gets caught up in the politics of nullification because at the same time this Cherokee decision is, is being decided, um, South Carolina has pulled the trigger on its threat to nullify uh, the tariff. They said in 1828, we're, we're going to do this, and then in 1832, they, they actually do do this. And Jackson is planning to ask Congress for a force bill, which will allow him to collect the tariff by force. But he needs to be sure that South Carolina is isolated and uh, his cal his, one of his fears with the Cherokee case is that if, if he were to do what he was supposed to do and see that the law was enforced, he might drive Georgia to join South Carolina in this nullifying spirit, possibly also Alabama and Mississippi because they also had uh, <clears throat> large Indian populations east of the Mississippi. Uh, so the missionaries who are bringing the suit are persuaded by their sponsors the, the Congregationalist Religious Board that picked them and employs them, they are persuaded in their jail cells to drop their suit. They're told, look, the university, of, of the, the survival of the country depends on you people. Hmm. Uh, so don't, you know, don't force Jackson to make, uh, to make a, a no-win choice. So they drop their suit. Uh, and then uh, Marshall and Story are, are invited to the White House and kind of fated, which, which they find very surprising. Story writes a letter to his wife saying that he shared a glass, you know, two, two glass, each had a glass of wine with Andrew Jackson. He said, who could have foreseen this? But it was just a result of this, this sort of political storm in which the whole Cherokee case occurred. And then years later, um, the, the federal government extorts a treaty from a faction of the Cherokees and they are, they are marched to Oklahoma. Uh, and the two ministers who dropped their suit accompany them. And they, they died and are buried in Oklahoma. Thank you. Your yeah, next question. Uh, this is uh, for Mr. Brockhauser, but anyone else can answer if they uh, so choose. Um, it's probably faux pas to bring up a another book that came out this year without precedent. Um, it's another good book, but um, your book makes me think of it. Um, I just kind of wonder, is it unfair to have limited John Marshall to his legacy on the court because, you know, he has further legacy, you know, as a statesman being in the XYZ affair and, and so on? Well, I, I think I covered his, his pre-court career as a Federalist, and uh, you know he was a very sharp one, a very political one, a very nimble one. Uh, the problem with that is the Federalist Party dies. I mean, he survives his own party. Uh, by, the, by the end of the War of 1812, um, they're gone. Uh, they've been, many of them have been anti-war secessionists, so the whole party uh, collapses, and John Marshall is the last Federalist left standing. I mean, he survives his own party by 20 years. So, so in a sense, all, all that work, uh, all that hard work that he did for them in the 1790s kind of washes away, and what he does that remains is what he did on the court. Let me just add one point. Uh, 
Those of you who like alternative history, it would have been interesting to uh, speculate what would happen if, uh, if Adams did not offer the seat in the court to, uh, to Marshall. I happen to think that he would have been, had a great political career, briefly toured the idea of running for, for presidency, but this is when he was already in the court. So I think he would have done extremely well, and, and maybe uh, there would have been a different outcome for the Federalist Party. I, I, I happen to think he was not only a great Secretary of State, for those of you, and the book describes it, he really was more than that because Adams was absent, particularly in the last few months of his administration. So he basically ran the government without ever being confirmed by the Senate. <laughs> Any other comments? Next question in the back. Uh, thank you. Uh, both some proponents and critics of expansive federal power look to Marshall and his opinion in McCulloch versus Maryland uh, regarding the necessary and proper clause and implied powers as the first in a line of cases that resulted in the massive and massively powerful uh, federal state that we have today. Uh, do you think there is truth in this narrative or uh, has Marshall been uh, misrepresented? Well, look, everything, you know, you can find precedence for anything. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the precedent was intending to point in that direction or that's the only direction it was pointing in. Uh, you know, in Gibbons v. Ogden, one of the minor players in that decision is Cornelius Vanderbilt. He, he, he works for Thomas Gibbons running his steamboat in and out of New York Harbor. and. Uh, Vanderbilt will become wealthier than the federal government. He will actually have more money himself personally than the federal government has. So it's, it's a very different world in which this is all going on. Could I add something to mm -hmm. that? Um, I have often heard it or read it said, read it, that Marshall, uh, th this, the premise of that question was that, well, Marshall laid the groundwork for, a, you know, for expansion of the federal government beyond what the founders intended, and that was the original sin that, you know, that led to other things that people don't like. And often the, the, the sentence is quoted from McCulloch, we must never forget or we must remember that it is a constitution we are expounding. And that is taken to be the justification not only for uh, overexpansion of federal power, but for reading the constitution in a particular way you know, that it's a, living, it's a living document, you know, this. And I, I cannot say how wrong that is. Uh, that, read the opinion. Um, you know, I'm not saying the questioner thinks that, but read the opinion. That sentence in the opinion is followed by paragraph after paragraph after paragraph of careful textual and structural analysis of the Constitution, right? Uh, the, what, what that sentence means in context is that we should read the grants of power to Congress and the Constitution in a way that's consonant with the structure of the Constitution in a fair and natural way. Um, not that Congress can do whatever it wants. I think that's a bad uh, misreading of Marshall. Yeah. Ten seconds. No, I, I, I'm actually a fan of McCullough. I happen to think that, and this is something that you, you can see in Marbury as well. You have somebody who is uh, very intelligent in, in expounding the, the meets and bounds of, of executive, well, let's say federal power, but also comes with cabining principles. And there's a lot of good cabining uh, in McCullough, which unfortunately is not something you meet in, in other NNP cases, which, and this whole issue loom large as to what is the precise cabining loom large in the Obamacare case. But uh, I mean, uh, in other, my favorite example, I, I love talking about uh, Marbury. There's a very expensive view of, of judiciary authority, actually not over Congress, congressional statutes, but over Article II. Cabin with a pretty good uh, exposition of what became to be known as political question doctrine. So it is a balancing, and, and, and my good friend, you know, Judge Duncan is absolutely right. It's cabining it in a context of an overarching constitutional structure, not looking at it just as, a, as one individual clause. Next. Um, Segwaying over to uh, Marbury versus Madison, there is a common uh, argument that you hear among legal academics uh, that in Marbury versus Madison, Justice Marshall was basically making it up to get to the right decision. Uh, I remember being in my uh, first day in federal courts class, and it was, uh, it was uh, Professor Steve Vladek who, who asked us, um, no, are, are you sure that Marbury is rightfully decided? I thought he was trolling us. Turns out he seriously believes this. Um, so is, I would just like to hear the panel's opinion on, is, is there something to this academic argument, or is it just uh, 
you know, one of the usual wrong academic arguments. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll, uh, I've got my book open to this uh, quote. You know, uh, Judge Pryor asked us at the outset for things that surprised us. Others might have known this. If I knew it, I've since forgotten it. But John Marshall, when he was a delegate to the Virginia Ratifying Convention, here's the speech he gave. And this will let you know, this uh, tells me uh, that this notion of judicial review was not, contrary to some academic perspectives, just cooked up out of whole cloth in 1803. This is what he said in 1787. If uh, it, the government, were to make a law not warranted by any of the powers enumerated, it would be considered by the judges as an infringement of the Constitution which they are to guard. They would not consider such a law as coming under their jurisdiction. They would declare it void. To what quarter will you look for protection from an infringement of the Constitution if you will not uh, if you will not give the power to the judiciary, there is no other body that can afford such a protection. If I hadn't told you where that was from, it's been long enough since you've read Marbury, you would have said that's from Marbury. That was 16 years before Marbury. Um, so I think the notion that judicial review was cooked up out of whole cloth in 1803 will not fly. I mean, Marshall told you about it in the ratifying convention in 1787 as if it's a paraphrase of what he was going to say 16 years later in Marbury itself. Well, and the arguments made in Federalist 78 by Hamilton. Right. Yeah. Um, it, 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 you know, the argument's been made that Marshall's opinion in Marbury is just really a restatement of Hamilton's argument. Um, you know, there's a lot of Machiavellian motives, though, that are attributed to Marshall and Marbury, um, one of which is that he wanted to create a precedent for judicial review. Right. When, how many times did um, the Marshall court ever cite Marbury for the proposition of the power of judicial review, and as zero, right. and as as the book correctly points out, if you look at Halton versus United States, which happened to uphold the Hamilton's tax on carriages, including some arrangement we can joke about in, in order to meet the jurisdictional threshold, they assume it. The person uh, before the court owned what was it, 158, 125 carriages. Carriages, and as you point out, there's probably only one person at that time in history, and that would be George the Third, who owned that many carriages. So the judicial review, in a sense, of being able to scrutinize and, and strike down or uphold, and Halton, they upheld the statute, but they could have easily struck it down, is, 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 is pretty obvious to me. I wish we had more time. What's interesting is how, how Marshall looked at the scope of judicial authority vis-a-vis uh, Article 2, both in terms of remedies, but also ability to exercise personal jurisdiction over uh, executive branch officials, again, cabined by political question doctrine. So let's just say that a lot of people write about Marbury. I have not read it or read it in a wrong way. Rick, do you have something to say about Marbury? I, I think the news of Marbury at the time was the, um, the run-up to the final decision, which is a long finger wag of the Jefferson administration. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's basically saying, oh, you guys said we were the bad guys and you were going to come in. You were going to be the good guys, but look, look at what you've done. You should have given William Marbury his commission, but you haven't done it. Now, I'm not, I can't give it to him because the law under which he is uh, applying for redress, this portion of it happens to be unconstitutional, but he had a right to it and you did wrong. And, and this was picked up in uh, the New York Post, which was Hamilton's newspaper. I, the headline was something like, um, uh, Administration Violates Constitution. I mean, Ham Hamilton got the point. <laughs> <laughs> One last point. The thing that struck me as, again, who practices law for a living is how remarkably short period of time it took from our argument. That, that I did not know. 14 days? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a blink of an eye. Right. <laughs> Thank you. In the back. Um, relatively short question. Uh, uh, unless I'm mistaken, I think uh, Chief Justice uh, John Marshall only ever authored one dissent in his 34-year uh, career on the bench. Now, I was just wondering if you could uh, uh, mention that case and why he dissented. Well, one dissent in a, const uh, in a case of constitutional import. Uh, the, there were a yeah. few other smaller ones, but, right. but the big dissent was Ogden v. Sanders. Uh, and, it, and it had to do uh, with a case involving bankruptcy law, and Marshall was denying that um, that contracts were creatures of law. He was saying that contracts are brought 
the right to contract is brought by men into society, really precedes society, and he even he even goes into this this very like Lockean or Rousseauian uh, fable. He tells a story about what we would now call cavemen. You know, one man has uh, more skins than he needs to clothe himself, and some other man may have more food than he needs to feed himself, and so they make an idea deal to exchange the skins for the food. Uh, and it's kind of an exercise in 17th or 18th century mythical anthropology to explain human rights. But, but he, he really believes that, that contracts are, are, are pre-social. Those are arrangements that men make with each other and have a right to make. Last question. Um, so you had mentioned how the, he got his seat on the Supreme Court because someone else had refused it. I seem to remember that John Marshall had been appointed and confirmed as the U.S. Attorney for Virginia, and been sent his commission, and then refused it and had to send, had to get it sent back. Do you know why he refused his commission? <coughs> um, he refused several off offers of federal jobs in the 1790s. That was one of them. I don't believe he had the commission already. Uh, that was a Washington offer. He was actually offered uh, a seat on the court uh, as an associate justice, and he turned, he turned that down. I believe that was from John Adams. I but, thought he had, it was also offered Attorney General of the United States. Is yeah, that I think so. He, you know, he, he wants to make money, and he's, he's very good at it. He, no, he, he's got a growing family. He's also buying buying land, buying farms, and, and buying slaves, as, uh, as Paul Finkelman uh, recently discovered. One other um, fact that I think is a testament to Marshall's simplicity and humility, um, when he takes the oath as Chief Justice, he wears the plain black robe that was the Whig tradition of Virginia. If you go to the Supreme Court of the United States and one of their great conference rooms with portraits of chief justices. You'll notice the portrait of our first chief justice, John Jay, with the beautiful scarlet colored uh, robes, what were called the party colored robes of the day. Uh, but ever since John Marshall, we've followed his tradition of a plain black robe. Uh, will you please join me in giving a warm uh, show of appreciation? Now, Mr. Brooke Kaiser will be available um, for those who want to get his book and to have him sign it. Uh, I want, before we break, though, I think, whoa, I've been cut. Please thank the Federalist Society and its staff for a terrific convention. Our closing reception is across the hall. Please enjoy.